بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد This is our 20th class of شرح الأصول الثلاثة uh, and it's after a very long Ramadanic vacation or break uh, I mentioned in two separate classes previous classes the structure and uh, breakdown of this book الأصول الثلاثة meaning how it was organized so you can refer to that in, uh, in uh, previous uh, uh, um, uh, classes. And it's important to know that to understand the book. But in summary, I'll give you uh, what we took so far. For the first chapter, it was four introductory principles. Al-ilm, al-amal, al-da'wa, al-sabr. Then we took chapter two. And chapter two has three subsections to it. A, B, C. Chapter 2a was matters pertaining to lordship and the creator. And if you remember, that in itself had a lot of subsections. Then chapter 2b uh, was uh, matters pertaining to shirk. And of course, the opposite of shirk is tawheed. And we stopped there. That's where we stopped. Now, chapter 2c is our topic today. And it pertains around and roams around wala in bara. And the closest terms to in English, I believe, is uh, alliance and disassociation. We'll use the Arabic terms, wala and bara. Alliance and disassociation is wala and bara. Alliance, what do we mean by alliance or wala? Wala to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, loyalty to Allah, to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the believers who obey Allah and His Messenger, and disassociation from the enemies and those who fight. And oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers. It's really pretty basic and simple. Very straightforward. Simple matter. And after we conclude wala and bara, which I doubt we'll be able to finish it today. Uh, we By then we'll conclude chapter 2. And we'll move on inshallah to chapter 3. It's a very lengthy topic. Wala uh, imbara. Ever since I was young, when I read books, I would write the titles categorized by subjects. When I looked under Wala imbara several days ago, I had a list of over 45 books or booklets or portions of books that have uh, chapters on Wala imbara. And that's to show you how intensive and deep this matter is. And that the ulama gave it plenty of attention and consideration. Wala and bara is worthy of an entire in-depth series by itself. Because it branches out into details. And it's among the main aspects of la ilaha illallah that the ummah needs today. In fact, the author's own grandson, Sulaiman ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, was one of the top ulama who carried on his father's, uh, uh, who carried his grandfather's manhaj. And he felt the need to write an entire separate booklet on Wala'an Bara called Awthaq Ura Al Iman. 
We'll mention, inshallah, essential matters that everyone needs to know. And in the future, if Allah grants us life and time, we may, we may, we may go into uh, deeper detailed issues that students of knowledge like to hear and know. So chapter two, matter number three, or you can put it as C in your notes, the author says, الثالثة. أن من أطاع الرسول The third matter is, is that whoever is obedient to the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم ووحد الله and singles out Allah with his worship in Tawheed So here he's saying, the author saying if what we established earlier in this booklet is implemented if you're obedient to the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم we talked about that. And that's number one. If you only worship Allah alone, we talked about that. That's basically what he's trying to tell you. If you have that established, those matters we talked about, then that entails, that necessitates something. What does it entail or necessitate? لا يجوز له موالاة من حد الله ورسوله ولو كان أقر بقر. It's not permissible for him to have alliance, to have موالاة with those who oppose Allah and His Messenger, even if he's the closest of the close to you. What's your proof? Where'd you get this from? His proof that he states. والدليل قوله تعالى لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يودون من حد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباهم وابنهم وإخوانهم وعشيرتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيدهم بروح من ويدخلهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه أولئك حزب الله ألا إن حزب الله هم المفلحون صوت المجادلة Allah says, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you'll not find people who believe in Allah in the last day. You will not find people who believe in Allah in the last day making muwala with those who oppose Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if they were their own fathers or their own sons or their own brothers or their own kindred, or their tribesmen, whoever they may be, أُولَٰئِكَ كَتَبَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمِ الْإِمَانِ For those who have muwala to Allah, أُولَٰئِكَ كَتَبَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمِ الْإِمَانِ Allah written faith in their hearts, and strengthen them with ruh. وَيَدْهُمْ بِرُوحٍ مِنْ Means proof, light, and true guidance. More proof on this matter is uh, uh, in Surah Al-Mumtahana. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا عدوي وعدوكم أولياء تلقون إليهم بالمودة وقد كفروا بما جاءكم من الحق O oh, you who believe Take not my enemy and your enemies as أولياء Show an affection towards them While they have disbelieved in, disbelieved in that which has come to you of truth In Surah At-Tawbah well, you don't really have to write these down because uh, you can go look up the translations. If your fathers, if your sons, if your brothers, if your wives, if your tribesmen, if your wealth that you have gained. وتجارة تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترضونها and commerce in which that you fear a decline and dwellings that you have delight and pleasure in ومساكن ترضونها what about all that stuff يا الله أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين if they're dear to you then Allah and his message and striving hard and fighting in the cause of Allah. If you love that more than Allah, if you love that more than Allah, you take it dear more than Allah and His Messenger, what happens? If you love any of that more than Allah and His Messenger, then wait. Then wait until Allah brings His decision. His decision of what? His decision of torment. 
His decision of torment, Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-fasiqeen, and Allah doesn't guide people who are fasiqeen. Meaning fasiqeen, the ones who are, are uh, disobedient to Allah and rebellious. Await. If you love any of that, more, just merely loving any of that more than Allah, which love is the core of Wal-Ambara, await catastrophes, torment, loneliness, massacres, genocide, humiliation. When does that happen, ya Allah? When you love anything more than Allah and His Messenger. Not just the enemies of Allah, you can't love more than Allah and Messenger. Even your wealth and your family, you can't love anything more, more than Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Love is at the core of wala. Ma'idah. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا الذين اتخذوا دينكم هزوا ولعبا من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم والكفار أولياء Oh you who believe Take not as أولياء Those who take your religion as mockery and play How could you take someone and be loyal him Who takes your religion The dearest thing to you as mockery and play and jokes من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم From among those who received the scripture before you and nor from those disbelievers. You can take them as awliya. In Surah uh, Ali Umran. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu. La tattakhidu bitanatan min dunikum. La ya'lunakum khabala. Waddu ma'anittum. Qad badat al-baghda'u min afwahihim. Wa ma tukhfi suduruhum akbar. Qad bayyanna lakum al-ayati in kuntum ta'qilun. Oh you who believe. Take not as bitana. Take not as your bitana. What does bitana here mean? Bitana here means those you take as consultants, protectors, adv- advisors. Don't take them outside your religion. Why? La ya'lu, why, ya Allah? why are you telling us this? What's the reason? La ya'lunakum khabala. They will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. What do ma'anittum? These are clear verses in the Quran. I'm not bringing nothing from my pocket. What do ma'anittum? Qad badat al min afwaim wa ma tukhfi sudurum akbar. They desire to harm you severely. Hatred has already appeared on their tongues and mouths, but what their breasts and hearts conceal is far worse. The textual proof on this is so much and so many. From the Quran, from the Sunnah, from the Sahaba, from the Ulama. Imam Hamad ibn Atiq, rahimahullah, in his book Sabil al Najaw al Fakak said, ليس في كتاب الله تعالى حكم فيه من الأدلة أكثر ولا أبين من 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 هذا الحكم أي الولاء والبراء بعد وجوب التوحيد وتحريم ضده. إمام حمد بن عتيق said after the oneness of Allah after the proofs on the oneness of Allah and prohibiting shirk its opposite which is prohibiting shirk. There's no ruling more, with more clear, more decisive proof than this matter that we have here. Which matter? Wala imbara. So first we took the proof. I could go on for this entire halaqa with verse after verse and hadith after hadith on this essential topic. Let's move on. The second point I want to talk briefly about is the importance of wala imbara. What is it overall? How can we understand it? What's this thing they call wala imbara? Especially us young, you young, Going up in the school. What is this thing? Wala and bara. What is it? Well, how is it a main part of La ilaha illallah? This topic really doesn't need a single verse or a single hadith to prove it. Not a single verse or hadith. The proof for this topic is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Wala and bara does not need a single letter of proof more than the word La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The Qurayshians who fought the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood wala imbara from the mere word of la ilaha illallah. They didn't need nothing else. They knew it from la ilaha illallah. This matter was so clear to everyone. In earlier generations, they didn't need to write about it and explain it and elucidate and argue back and forth. It was clear. Wala imbara was clear. It was not an issue needing an explanation or talk until those philosophers who gave their undeveloped minds precedent over the text of the Quran and the Hadith coming out, giving their input. That's when the explanation and the elucidations and what the ulama meant. They are the ancestors of those who gabble today in what they don't know, thinking they know it all. I don't know nothing about Football. I even m- several times, wallahi, put an effort to learn football. I couldn't. I don't know the details of it. 
That's even though I grew up here. Uh, Subhanallah, Allah blocked my mind from it for some reason. Even though I tried because my nephew, may Allah protect him, is a, is a, uh, and safeguard him, he's a professional pl- player. And I never could learn this game. I do not know what they're doing when they're playing. There is one thing I do know for sure about that sport. When you join a football team and you cheer for the opposite team, what happens? In Mexico, people get hurt for matters like that in soccer. Why? It's embedded. It's natural. It's fitra. You don't need to be told this. You're part of the team. You're a team player. You owe a duty of loyalty and alliance to your team. It's common sense when you join a team that you're part of that team. You don't cheer for the opposite team. You don't ever cheer for cheer for the opposite team. You don't even wish in your heart that they win. You're deceiving your team, even if it's in your heart. You can't take the coach or captain of the opposite team and hail him with praises and love and loyalty. You just can't do that. Or tell the coach of the opposite team a weakness that you see in your own team. Whether you're joking, whether you're serious, whether you didn't mean it, you don't do that. You don't do that. Let me take it further. When your own team makes mistakes, and that happens a lot in sports, they get angry, missed passes, lost plays. Uh, the, the, the teammates scream at each other. They yell at each other. Sometimes it gets out of hand where they push and shove. Sometimes it gets fully out of hand where the teammates of one team fight. That happens. That happens. My question is, do you go to the rival team or the rival team's coach or captain and say, my team members didn't pass the ball at the proper time and complain to them? Do you go to the opposite team's coach or the captain or the players and tell them, come here, help me fight my own teammates and massacre them and commit genocide with them? The core structure of gangs, street bums and gangs, bums in the streets and gangs and criminals, the core structure of gangs is wala and bara to that gang. In religious institutions, all religions, the core matter of it is wala and bara. Nations, the core matter of the structure of that nation is wala and bara to that nation. If you look at nations and countries, the worst crime in a nation, in a country, is treason against that country and against the government. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to the security of that nation to have people commit treason. Treason is wala and bara to that country. Now, pay attention. If, if wala and bara is essential to a mere soccer league, a little soccer league, or a football team, if it's fundamental to the progress, continuation, and success of any nation, why is it so difficult for Muslims today to have wala and bara to la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? That's wala and bara. It's fitra. It's common sense. It's common sense. Merely la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah says wala and bara. You don't need none of the proofs that I mentioned to you. You don't need a single verse on that. But Allah revealed them all in the hadith to emphasize the importance of this matter. Today the deluded munafiqeen want you to join the team of La ilaha illallah, but they want you to cheer, to support, to clap, to aid, to abet everyone and everything, but the team of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah that you joined. This is an important topic. Because this topic is the identity of a Muslim. Let me repeat. Wala imbara is the identity of a Muslim. Wala imbara is the selfhood of a Muslim. Without this topic fully embedded in your hearts, especially in non-Muslim lands, the grandparents and great-grandparents of today are given birth to future non-Muslim grandkids and great-grandkids. Whoa, what? Let me repeat that to you. Let me repeat that to you. Listen closely. Without true belief and understanding of wala and bara for everyone, but more so for those in non-Muslim lands, for everyone, the grandparents and great-grandparents, us, we're going to have kids inshallah, and great-grandkids and great-grandkids, the grandparents and great-grandparents of today 
are giving birth to future non-Muslim grandkids and great-grandkids. What do you mean? What do you mean? Let me tell you what I mean over here. Let me tell you this example, you understand it. Uh, a family I know very well, very well, uh, and I can even name the names. In 1920 or so, two brothers came to this country from Jordan. One of them settled and one of them returned. One who returned, he didn't like it here or didn't go well for him, he returned. The one of them stayed here. So now that one who stayed here, there's possibly four or five generations now since it's the 1920s. Uh, the great grandfather who returned to Jordan, his descendants overall are all Muslim. They all have the spirit of Islam. At the end of the day, you ask them, they'll tell you we're Muslim. Yes, some of them are astray, some of them are sinners. But inshallah, they all have Tawheed and La ilaha illallah in their hearts. And inshallah, one day they'll come back to the true teachings. The brother who remained in this country and died here, and most of his first generation children, I believe, are all dead now. There's now four to five generations from that man. They grew up in a city, and there's so many of them, that a city in the United States is named after them. Do you know from the descendants of that man who remained in this country from the 1920s, there's not a single one who says, I'm a Muslim? I'm not saying that they neglected their salah so they're not Muslim. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when you ask them, what's your religion? He's either Christian or Catholic or Buddhist or uh, Hindu or atheist. A lot of them are atheists. This is something I know firsthand with names and details. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide them back to Tawheed and Islam. We got to ask why. We spoke many, many times that non-Muslims can never be compelled to say La ilaha illallah. It's impossible. La ikraha fi deen even when Islam is ruling a nation, and there's not Muslim living under it, it's impossible that we force or coerce anyone into Islam. Impossible. Even when the rulers of that country are by the solid Sharia, the ideal Sharia, the ideal Khilafah, they even get protection from Muslims, the utmost protection, while they're on their false belief. Non-Muslims get treated under Muslim rule better than, wallahi, better than they treat us when they're, we're under their rule. Non-Muslims get treated under Muslim rule better than their own people treat them when they're under their own people's rule. That's when there's the ideal Khilafah. But at the same time, and here's what I'm trying to get at, that treatment doesn't mean we approve or condone their false, tampered, made up, Belief. We treat, for example, Ahl al-Dhimma, those who live under Muslim rule, and you know they're weak and vulnerable because they're living under Muslim rule. A lot of Muslim, Muslim are the popular and the strong ones. They live under Muslim rules. At times, the Muslims got to protect them. But we teach our kids and we put in our hearts that their faith is false faith. We embed it in our hearts, in our minds, in our kids' minds. That that cross that they're wearing, if someone dies believing in it, they will be in blaze in hell forever. You have to teach that. You have to know that. You have to solidly believe that. When you have Muslims that are taught that the faith, the faith have minor differences amongst them. That they downplay the difference in belief in shirk and tawheed. It's not a biggie. They say uh, we're all going to heaven. Your religion, my religion, same God, we're all going to heaven, so nothing really matters. They say Jesus is the Son of God, Isa is the Son of God, we say He's the Messenger of God. It really means the same thing. When you get down to it, it's really a technical linguistic difference. When you boil it down, where all the Abrahamic religions and all the Quran said, it, everyone's going to heaven. It's in the Quran, and they, they falsify this, in tamper. The deviants also say explicitly or implicitly, uh, anyone who mentions hell or anyone who's going to hell, that someone's going to hell, that's a radical extreme, extremist. Hell, Jahannam these days, uh, without wala and bara has become to many like an abandoned dwelling that no one enters. It's just there to be there. No one's going to hell. 
It's as if, uh, if Allah, Ma'ad Allah created it in vain. That's basically what they're saying. Ma'ad Allah. Ta'ala Allah and dhalik uluwan kabir. What, what's the result of that distorted teaching? The first generation of Muslims without wala and bara will hold some ground to la ilaha illallah. Possibly. Second generation, third generation possibly, may have the smell of la ilaha illallah. The fourth, fifth and ongoing will be atheists, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, Scientologists, whatever you want. They have it without wala and bara. This, that's all because of the deficiency in wala and bara. Because it's your religious identity, that's, that's what it is. Wala and bara is our religious uniqueness as Muslims. Wala and bara is our personality. 15 years ago, I was at a lecture. And a famous lecture gave a very uh, popular talk that he always goes around giving about Islam, the Islam's history. Early on Muslims in this country and early on Masajid. He had a projector with, uh, with uh, pictures of old Masajid. That particular lecture was about Muslims who came from overseas as slaves and those who embraced Islam in this country. And he had some real solid evidence of the existence of Islam very early on. Everyone was so happy, was so happy to hear the Masajid back in the 1800s or even, I don't remember, before that or after that. And after the lecture, we sat down to eat. I said, that those Masajid are gone. But where are those communities of Muslims? Where are the Muslims? Where are the descendants of those Muslims that you've been talking about for the past hour and a half? I know and I understand that structures in Masajid burn down, they fall, they deteriorate over time. But what masjid did the congregation transfer to? Where on earth are those people you're talking about? Where are their descendants? Those Muslims you were talking about in the 1800s, they're all barren, they didn't have no kids that we can see today? If they're barren, I can understand that. They didn't have kids, so that means there's no Muslim kids out of them that came. According to the numbers that he was talking about, for example, for example, the overwhelming majority of African American are supposed to be Muslim. And there's more than that from other uh, origins. Muslims should be way more than the I want to know where they're at. Where they're at. It's impossible that they all were barren, they couldn't conceive kids. He said, that's a good question, I don't know. There should be studies done on that. I said, don't you think over the decades and the centuries, they were washed out of Islam. You don't really got, I'm going to save you some time. You don't got to do no studies. Don't you think they were washed out of time? No wala and bara embedded in their hearts. And look at this. If this was back in the days where there was merely no wala and bara due to ignorance. Imagine how it is today and what your kids are going to be are going to turn out to be when it's not only ignorance in wala and bara, it's a full blown war on the teachings of la ilaha illallah and wala and bara. The bombshells fallen on wala and bara by those who claim to be of our own, claiming to be Muslim in dua and shiyukh, are more dangerous, more lethal than the bombshells that fall on the heads of the innocent brothers and sisters throughout the world. Wallah al-Azim. Wallah al-Azim, there's a war on wala and bara. Wallah al-Azim. Don't get me wrong. Enemies of Islam, they always had an issue with Islam. And they always had an issue with wala and bara. It's nothing new and it's nothing to be surprised about. But now the problem is with the munafiqeen of our ummah that claim to be followers of this ummah who are spreading a contaminated form of wala and bara. A lethal dosage of wala and bara. That's going to take you out of your Islam. Locally, my father was a founder of a local masjid. He took the responsibility of that masjid and he was at the core of changing it. It was built in the 30s. But my father, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him a long life full of deeds, was a main person in charge of it in the 60s and the 70s. Along with a sheikh from Yemen, uh, who was a one of the first graduates of the Islamic University of Medina and came here uh, as a da'ya. May Allah raise his rank to Firdaus 
as I heard he died recently. And he left me some books when I was a young boy to read. One of them was Kitab al-Tawheed. The upper floor of that masjid was, uh, was a wedding, uh, was a masjid. The bottom was a, a wedding hall where they have music and parties and at times alcohol was served in it. My father and this imam went over the masjid and changed it to a masjid, upper and uh, basement of it. I remember my father would go make salah and sit from Maghrib to Isha. And on a good Jum'ah, not on a good day, on a good Jum'ah there would be three to four old men. And my father would be the youngest and I was the only kid. At times, I remember when they would sit in Maghrib and Isha and there was parties downstairs. The old man would go downstairs, Wallah, I remember. They would go downstairs and tell them to lower the music for five minutes so they can offer Maghrib or Isha. Wallah, I remember it as a kid. The names and families of the founders of that masjid in the 30s we know. I just want you to do one thing. Go do a study on what happened to most of their grandkids. Where are they? What happened to them? You, I'm not going to talk about it. It's hurtful to talk about it. But you're going to be surprised at what you're going to come out, at the results you're going to see. Do a study and come back and tell me what you find. I don't want to sit and make our precious moments of this Tawheed class storytelling ones. But this needs to be told so you can know what wala and bara is. To know the danger of having a deficiency in the belief of what in wala and bara. It must be said like it is by the ulama, by the shiuch, by the dua, by the Muslims. Why? To discharge our duty before our Lord and free ourselves from guilt before Allah when we meet Him. Deluding this topic makes what every enemy of Islam wants. What is it they want? They want Muslims that appear from the outside like they're Muslims. A name Muslim. On his card is Muslim. But inside they're like a tree trunk that's hollow and rotted out. That's what they want to see. You look at the tree, you think it's nice, it's beautiful, big. You get closer, you see a hole in it. And the slightest breeze or push or touch will blow it down to the ground. That huge trunk that you thought was strong. The enemies of Islam hate this topic with a passion. Why? It's nearly close to impossible to take someone out of Islam into another faith. It happens, I'm not going to deny. But it's extremely rare, very rare. It's very difficult to get a Muslim and take him out of their faith into another faith. Tawheed is very heavy on the hearts. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah leaves a deep impact on the heart when one believes in it. A da'aya told me once that evangelists or missionaries went to a very impoverished, poverty, drought-stricken Muslim town or towns. And they had a crew of doctors and loads of food and medicine, construction workers and, and equipment. You know how parents are when their kids get sick. They get desperate for help from anyone. They probably at times willing to do anything for it. They brought these simple vaccinations for the kids and, and they helped the kids. And when they would help or do anything, they have a picture of what they claim is Isa, alayhi salam. And they say, this is from your Lord Isa. They helped them reconstruct their mud houses. They helped them bring food. Uh, they helped them every step of the way. In every step of the way, they would tell them, this is from uh, Isa, your Lord. Finally, before they were about to leave, they were done and they thought they, these people graduated. They thought they had them. They had a goodbye party. They brought generators and they wanted to show them a movie on the, on the projectors. These people don't know what electricity is. Now suddenly they're watching movies on a projector. And the projector brings an image of what they claim is Isa alayhi salam. And the projector brings this image closer and closer. And you know, the picture gets bigger and bigger. And the evangelist tells them, the crusader tells them, this is the son of Allah, or this is Allah. This is the one who brought and cured and this and this for you. Just when they thought they had them, one of the leaders of those tribes innocently jumped up in astonishment when he seen what they claim is Allah. He jumped up in astonishment. He said, La ilaha illallah. That's Allah. La ilaha in astonishment the word tawheed came out of his heart and out of his tongue they had hope 
But it didn't work because La ilaha illallah leaves an impact on the heart. It's extremely difficult to take La ilaha illallah out of the hearts. So number one, La ilaha illallah is difficult to take out of the hearts. Number two, many knowledgeable in their falsified scripture, those who really know what they're talking about in their scriptures, feel that a Muslim or even an ex-Muslim is not worthy of joining their religion. We don't want these people. So what's the solution? But we don't want them as Muslim, but we don't want them in our faith. The goal of the haters, the conclusion is, not to take Muslims into their faith, but rather to take Muslims out of their faith. Just take Muslims out of their faith. Just take them out of their faith and let them run like wild animals astray in the wilderness. This is why they openly intervened in Muslim countries and Muslim curriculums, namely in the lands of the Haramain, our holiest, to remove and dilute this topic of wala and bara in their curriculum. They ordered in particular that the authorities in the lands of the Haramain to remove and change the curriculum of wala and bara in the grade school and even in the universities. This is public facts. I'm not saying anything from my own. This is not hidden, this is not made up. Go research it and you'll see. It started or intensified or it got to the media around 2003 and then in 2006 and 2007. The stooges and subordinates in Bilad al Haramain said to their masters what they should have said to Allah. They said to their masters, we obey, we adhere, we'll take care of it. In fact, in fact, it got to a point where even Salih al Fuzan openly and publicly stood up against this matter and objected to the change in the curriculum in public, wrote against it. And after the curriculum changed and matters changed, over time they made out of Mecca a center to call for interfaith. They mask it with this dialogue, baloney, but it's really interfaith. I collected and wrote an article on our old site. I don't know what happened to, to, it, uh, to the article. Uh, if you remember, I gathered 30 names of 30 ulama in the lands of the Arabian Peninsula who called someone kafir or, or kufr who believe or adopt or promote interfaith. There's even a fatwa by the official ulama. Official ulama. Hayat kibar ulama considering it kufr. Wallahi, one scholar who the murji'a attribute themselves to in the lands of Haramain said, whoever calls for inner faith is worse than Jews and Christians. Every main aspect of interfaith is aimed to attack and demolish our aqidah in wala and bara. The purpose of interfaith is to destroy wala and bara. I'm going to be clear with you. Now we have the dua who are called, who we call ruwaybidah. Their ultimate purpose has become to demolish the aqidah of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They use interfaith as a sneaky way to mask their demolition of wala and bara in the true authentic belief of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Or rather Islam, because Islam is wala and bara and wala and bara is Islam. These ruwaybida have made fools out of themselves even to the kuffar themselves. They're the ones they aim to please. I, I heard of, of experts, this week an expert, expert on what he, they claim radical Islam and terrorism, or what they call terrorism. He said in the West they've been teaching such a deluded form of Islam that it's no longer making sense to the youth, rather it's generating an opposite of what it was intended to do. It's creating jihadists. This is an expert saying this, making fun of them. Many of the du'a and shuyukh today who are anti-wala in bara, deluded in the teaching, and tainted, virgin of Islam, and tainted the virgin of Islam, and work for the enemies of Islam. Twelve years ago, this week, those same men appeared in their teaching as solid and wala in bara as can be. Notice I say appeared. A Muslim doesn't molt. They appeared twelve years ago to be solid and wala in bara. They appeared. Meaning if you go back 12 years ago to their recordings and before that, it will refute what they're barking about today and what they've been poisoning the Ummah with in the past 12 years. 
I don't think you need a rocket scientist to tell you what changed. Uh, you, you, you can guess on your own. Uh, this is dua, not only in the West, but in the East, there's just as many, if not more. Uh, look at their faces, and look at their aqidah, 12 years ago, and before that, and look at them today. Look at them, and listen to them. Now, they clip their wala and bara, so Allah clipped their appearance from the honor of looking like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Compare and analyze and think. Now don't tell me they are the Shafi'is of our time. They seem circumstances and they recanted and because of different circumstances, different situation, they changed like a Shafi'i. I heard them use it. Allah used this excuse. I personally heard some of them use it. They say among, they say we're like a Shafi'i. In Iraq, Iraq had his own madhab. Then he went to Egypt. Uh, people and circumstances were different. So he had a totally different madhab for the people in Egypt there. Shafi'i fil qadim, Shafi'i fil jadid. They make it as if a Shafi'i rahimahullah established laws of Islam for Iraq where he was and a different set of laws of Islam for the people in Egypt because of different circumstances, different nature, different people. I'm going to address that later on. But that's one of their claims. But look with me. In Ibn Abi Shayba, and Al-Hakim fil Mustadrak, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman said, you know who Hudayfa is? The, trust, the trustee of the secrets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, listen to what he said, مَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ يَعْلَمَ أَصَابَتْهُ الْفِتْنَةُ أَوْ لَا فَلْيَنْظُرُ Hudayfa said, if you want to know if you were hit by a fitna by Allah, if Allah misguided you, you want to test it? If you want to know, then look, he gave us a test to see if Allah hit one of us with fitna or not. If Allah misguided one. فَإِنْ رَأَى حَلَالًا كَانَ يَرَاهُ حَرَامًا If he used to deem matters halal, that he used to regard as halal, and he, now he, he changed it, he flipped it. أَوْ يَرَى حَرَامًا كَانَ يَرَاهُ حَلَالًا فَلْيَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ قَدْ أَصَابَتُهُ فِتْنَةً Or matters that he made haram, which he used to deem halal, then he has been hit with a fitna by Allah. What Hudayfa means, not an innocent person learning and he finds out this is haram and halal, or a sheikh on one issue here or there over time, finds out the proof was not authentic or something like that. What Hudayfa means by switching the haram to halal and the halal to haram, he means those who change their harams to halal and their halal to haram to make it easy and pleasurable to them and to please others who are not Muslims. That's what he means. And worse than that is those who change their aqidah. If he's talking about haram and halal and halal haram, worse than that is those who change their aqidah. What a coincidence. The sudden changes in the principles of Islam so suddenly, so drastically all happened 12 years ago. What's going on here? What happened? Did they all suddenly get some type of revelation we don't know about? Well, what, what was it that happened that their aqidah so suddenly changed? Drastic change overnight. In another narration, in Musannaf, uh, in Musannaf Abd al-Razzaq, and in, uh, in uh, Sunan al-Bayhaqi, Abu Mas'ud al-Badri entered upon Hudayfa. Abu Mas'ud al-Badri walked in on the Sahabi Hudayfa, the same Sahabi we're talking about, the holder of the secrets of the Prophet He said, advise me. He's seeking advice from the Prophet, the man the Prophet وسلم, trusted with secrets. He said, إِيَّاكَ وَالتَّلَوَّنْ إِيَّاكَ وَالتَّلَوَّنِ فِي فَإِنَّ, فإن دِينَ اللَّهِ وَاحِدٌ Don't be like a snake shedding skin in the deen of Allah. A Muslim skin does not molt in the deen of Allah. The molten in the deen of Allah by some dua has become a topic of mockery to the non-Muslim journalists and to the non-Muslim experts in these matters. Being firm on the correct ways and honor. Say alhamdulillah if you're on the firm way and you've been on it. Wallahi al-azim, it's the biggest blessing you could get. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي نِعْمَتِي It's an honor many had, but Allah deemed them unworthy of it, so He stripped many of that honor and kept the very few. Those who bolster in interviews about having been on the aqeed of the sahaba and now they left it. They bolster about that today. Don't bolster, big boy. Don't bolster about that, big boy. Wallah al-Azim, following in the footsteps of the Sahaba was an honor. Allah the Almighty stripped you from it. Who keeps people firm on the right aqeedah? 
And who takes them away from the right aqeedah? Allah tells his own beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَوْلَا أَنْ ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِتَّ تَرْكَنُوا إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا Muhammad, you would have been misguided if Allah didn't keep you on the right guided path. Had we might not made you stand firm, O Muhammad, you would have nearly inclined to them a little. That's talking to the Prophet sallallahu An Arabic poem, poet who's seen changes in his scholars in his area, said, لَيْسَ الْخَلِيلُ عَلَى مَا كُنْتَ تَعْهَدُهُ قَدْ بَدَّلَ اللَّهُ ذَاكَ الْخِلَّةِ أَلْوَانًا Your friends are no longer what you used to see them as. They went through phases and phases of molten and changing. As fitan go on, as the snow keeps melting, and as the, re- you, the more you will see of the reality of many more. That's the great benefit of the struggles that the ummah goes through. The snow melts, you see what's under it. لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ Don't you know? Don't you see those who went 12 years ago from teaching Tawheed in Shirk in Wala and Bara to becoming suddenly like uh, Gloria Borger wannabes, the CNN's chief uh, analyst. You look left and right and in front of you and behind you, where are the people of the Haqq? And that reminds me of a statement Sheikh Kishk rahimahullah used to say back in the 60s. He used to say the real and true Islam is behind the prison walls. There are the few. There are the pure. There are. There are many of them. They, but there are few. Regardless of their number, they are the few. They are the pure. And they are the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me conclude with this hadith. Listen to this hadith. A prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though some spoke about the narration, the, the chain of authenticity of this hadith, it's authentic, it, it's authenticated by many. And among them is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned this um, this hadith in uh, Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada. You'll find good talk on uh, the chain of authenticity in, in, in its narration in Takhrij al-Hadith Mishkat al-Masabih. It's, it's on the authority of Usama bin Zayd and uh, Abu Huraira and Ibn Mas'ud and Ali uh, and Ibn Umar and Mu'ad and other Sahaba. A prophecy and an honor for a category of people of knowledge. A category of people of knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst them. The Prophet sallallahu said, يَحْمِلُ هَذَا الْعِلْمِ مِنْ كُلِّ خَلَفٍ عُدُولَةٍ There will be just, credible descendants who carry this knowledge from their forefathers. A praise from the Prophet for the few, the righteous, that carry on this deen as pure as it was when it was first revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu What's their main duties? What's their characteristics? In this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu mentions three characteristics, three qualities of these people that he praised and glorified. They're worthy of praise and glory because of three characters, characteristics. Number one, يَنْفُونَ عَنْهُ تَحْرِيفَ الْغَالِينَ The first characteristic has غَال in it. The, the, the غَال is one who exceeds his limits. Uh, here, of course, it means one who exceeds his limits in matters pertaining to religion. Meaning those who go extreme. They are, for example, like the Qawarij, who went to an extreme. And they took text intended to be geared, for example, to the Kuffar, and put it on the sinners of the Mus Ummah. They went to an extreme. The Prophet ﷺ warned about ghulu, in, uh, which is the, the word for similar to extreme, in ibadah as well. When he said, why do certain people do this and this and that? In the famous hadith. You see that in takfir. You see that in wala and bara. Uh, you see those who do a domino effect on takfir. Among Muslim inhabitants of an entire nation. And I wouldn't believe it if I didn't hear it myself. An entire nation, they consider them kuffar. A domino effect. There is this ghulu in this topic. In wala and bara. Uh, Some went to an extreme. Especially lately, when the ulama no longer began to teach this topic, and then the West put a ban on it, thinking they're smart. Uh, in the East, they didn't let them teach it in the East. So many young brothers went out on their own reading the text, or second-hand text of Ibn Taymiyyah and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. And some, few, few, may have uh, went to ghulu in it. Many who have never touched Ibn Taymiyyah's original works, first-hand, 
use snippets of his work to declare Muslims kuffar in totality. Like I said, I wouldn't believe if I didn't hear myself the one person who declared the entire uh, uh, nation kuffar. I read the works of Ibn Taymiyyah several times, from the first to the last. Every time you read it, it's mind-boggling. You need giants to break it down for you. You need to be careful and have thorough knowledge of his style as well as comprehensive reading of his entire work or at least comprehensive reading of his entire work on the area you're trying to talk about. Especially with Ibn Taymiyyah. To understand his fatawa on crucial matters, you need to gather the shattered fatawa throughout his majmu'ah and you have to take them collectively to understand and then go and understand who he was talking about in each fatwa to understand the circumstances behind the fatwa if you want to adopt it, if you want to go by it. Today you see those who, some, not many alhamdulillah, who take from second-hand booklets, translated languages, and then want to declare entire nation kuffar. You can take statements out of context from the imams of Najd and nearly declare everyone who's living in the West today a kafir. Ma'adhallah, that they say that or that we say that or that anyone would say that. But I'm just saying, you can take certain statements out of context. That's why it's essential to study these books with the ulama. So the first characteristics of the people that the hadith mentions is yanfuna anhu tahrif al-ghalil. They protect and guide this religion from the distortion of taking matters to an extreme. The second characteristics, وَانْتِحَالَ الْمُبْطِلِينَ Wallah al-Azim, it says if the Prophet is sitting amongst you here today talking to you, telling you this hadith. Prophecy of the Prophet And it's true today. اِنْتِحَالَ الْمُبْطِلِينَ Are those who take the text out of Context, the, 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 take, take text out of its context and bend and twist its meaning to suit their desires. They crop the proof out like you crop a photo in a Photoshop program. Like, woe to those who pray and put a period there. Wailu lil musallin and stop. A more practical example is, is, is wala bara, for example. Those who take one category of wala bara, crop it from the other categories and make it as if it's the only branch of wala and bara that there is. And we'll talk about it inshallah next halaqa. Part of wala and bara, as many ulama mentioned, and you can read it in Al-Qarrafi, uh, who mentioned it in his book, Al-Furuq. Uh, um, part of it is to be peaceful, kind to non-warrior, non-Muslims, Ahl al-Dhimma. That's part of wala and bara. In fact, at time, Muslims are responsible before Allah to defend the non-Muslims. They got to put their life at stake for that. Al-Qarrafi mentioned this in wala and bara when he speaks about this matter. Now, you got the modernists who take that category, crop it out from the rest of wala and bara in teaching and make it seem like it's all of wala and bara. It's as if the Prophet ﷺ is here taught, teaching you. The third characteristics of the people the Prophet ﷺ praised of with knowledge are those who protect knowledge from ta'wil al jahili First one was those who protect the teaching from ghulu, from extreme. The second one was who protect it from the likes of the modernists to crop and bend and twist the, the proofs to suit their desires and their, uh, their masters at times. The third category is about those who are ignorant. There's some who are ignorant, who speak in ignorance. Ta'wil al-jahileen. These are those who are ignorant. They misrepresent uh, text. Uh, they interpret it wrong. Some of them, ha they actually all of them have no knowledge because they're ignorant. Uh, they have no knowledge and they have no foresight. They hit you with verse after verse and hadith after hadith. Uh, not even knowing what the ulama said about them and not even knowing if they're abrogated or not. Those are the ignorant people. Some may not b mean to be evil, but their actions speak for themselves. And some are in really, really evil ignorant people. They have in common, both of them, the ignorant and the evil and non-evil, they, they have in common that they speak without knowledge. And they are the likes of those who I mentioned a brief talk about when I said, who's not a sheikh today? 
uh, if you look at, for example, eating swine, drinking alcohol, you will see there's exceptions where one can eat and drink that if there's a necessity, if there's a darura. But speaking about Allah without knowledge, there's no exception to it. وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal commenting on this hadith, he said, Alhamdulillah, in every era, Allah has those few who call people to the correct guidance and deter people from evil. How many killed by Iblis did they bring back to life? How many slaughtered by the shaitan did they bring back to life? How many astray and misguided did they bring back to the right path? How many... How, uh, how beautiful is their effect on people? They are the honorable guardians of the deen of Allah. And then he mentions the, the, the statements of this hadith. In conclusion for today, in conclusion for today's talk, I want to say, wala in bara is at the core meaning of la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, after the tawheed of Allah. One of the top meanings after the oneness of Allah. Wala in bara is the identity of a Muslim. Wala in bara is the armor that protects the descendants from changing their faith decades and centuries from now. You got to look to that and plan from now and have the proper belief in wala in bara. They hate wala in bara so much because it's the identity of a Muslim that they don't want us to have. They want our religion to melt in their melting pot. That's what they want. Before I started the class today, I asked you all a question when we're having the little talk. I said, what's the biggest rival football teams? You said in Michigan, it's Michigan versus Michigan State. Michigan versus Michigan State in Michigan. And on the professional level, you told me, it's uh, the P uh, Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, correct. Okay, I'm not here to uh, talk about sports. Uh, I'm, I'm here to make a point. I'm not trying to keep up about sports and it doesn't interest me at all, Wallahi. But I'm trying to make a point. What would you say if I was a player on the field for the Pittsburgh Steelers wearing the shoulder pads, the helmet and all the gear and I intentionally pass the ball to the Baltimore Ravens? What do you say about me? What does everyone, the, the hundreds of thousands in those stands, what do they say? Or imagine, I'm benched, I'm a player bench. I'm sitting at the bench, drinking the, the water. And I play for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And my heart gets delighted and happy and I cheer and jump up and clap and jump up and down every time the Baltimore Ravens score. What do you think about me? Or I'm on the Pittsburgh Steelers team, uh, but when they come to interview me, I keep praising and glorifying the Baltimore Ravens and say they're the best, they're the most qualified, they're the greatest, they're the strongest, they're the sincerest. What do you call me? A traitor. That's the traitor. That's the characteristics of a traitor. A treasonist. A collaborationist. That's what it is. That's what I am about. Those deviant shiukh of today want you to call yourself Muslim, but cheer and praise and love and support everyone but your own side, the side of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The world today wants wala and bara snatched out of your hearts. Not because of harm it did to them, but because of what Allah said in the Quran. Many of the people of scripture wish that they could turn you away as disbelievers after you have believed. Why? Why do they want to do that? Why do they want to do that? Why do they want to do that? Out of envy from their own selves. Hasadan. Hasadan. Even after the truth has come, become manifest and known to them. Fa'fu wasfahu hatta yati Allahu bi amrih. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Forgive and overlook until Allah brings His command. Uh, we will continue inshallah on next halaqa uh, with this topic. Inshallah.